thank you, and uh, thank you, David, for all your great contributions. Um, I want to start my talk with this picture. <laughs> I, I, I threatened David last night that I was going to show this or something like this. This is, uh, I think, some of the folks here will recognize this as one of the very early images from David's work, and it actually it, it, it illustrates uh, three things I'd like to point out. I guess one is uh, the wells, which you heard about yesterday, this concept of putting wells and, and etching uh, structures into, in this case, silicon oxide um, optical fibers, uh, which has been really a hallmark of, of his work. Uh, beads, uh, actually these are not really very good beads, but they look something else, like something else to me, but I won't say what. Um, and uh, then uh, this is one of his early chemical sensors. These were basically polymer blobs put on to the end of an optical fiber. As David mentioned, um, early on, they were just throwing things on the top of optical fibers and not actually taking advantage of um, etching um, wells into those structures. And um, really what that led to, it's kind of the third thing I wanted to say, is that this really led to a, a, a huge range of ideas and spun out ideas from this one concept of, or those, those two concepts of, of beads and and optical fibers. And um, I don't want to go through all of these, but this, this is a, a chart that I made up uh, just to list, I think, some of the first. And some of those you heard about, especially the tail end of this list um, from, in, in David's talk. But, uh, you know, uh, I think probably the imaging fibers for sensing this nature paper here and the DNA micro wet array, which ultimately uh, led them to the uh, random arrays, which then when David didn't point out, then became a technology that founded uh, Illumina, which at, at one point anyway, uh, last time I checked, it was at a $9 billion market capitalization, probably one of the most successful biotech companies uh, uh, today. And, um, and the last thing, sort of fourth thing I'd like to point out about this is that often when you look at something like this, you might not think or imagine that that has any great innovation in it. I mean, often our science is ugly, and it's, you try really hard to get something that really looks crappy and performs crappy to get it to work. And, but that's the key aspect of it, is that's the first time you do it. And I, you, as you saw in David's talk, uh, some of the beautiful arrays they make now don't look anything like this. And that's really the nature of innovation. So I'm going to talk about uh, silicon uh, materials. Uh, and they have pores in them, and they're etched in them, but they're uh, etched by electrochemical means, not by chemical means. And it's a silicon, the element, uh, rather than silicon oxide. Um, and the story goes back uh, quite some time, back when David was doing all of his seminal work in the early uh, optical fiber days. We were working with um, porous silicon. This is a nanostructured form of silicon. Um, and uh, found that we could uh, make this material uh, luminescent. Actually, it was discovered by Lee Canham about two years before this paper. Uh, and that then, then that material could be removed uh, from a silicon substrate, this porous material, uh, which is shown here. This is a little bit about a one or two centimeter uh, on edge silicon wafer with a, a pad of porous silicon etched into it. This is a black light image showing the photoluminescence of that material and that this material could be removed from that substrate and made into little particles, and those particles were luminescent. And uh, the pictures didn't look pretty then either. Uh, they look a lot better now. But um, the bottom line really is that you can take silicon, uh, dissolve it away electrochemically, and you're left with this uh, scaffolding or skeleton of still pure silicon. And I think probably the key aspect for my talk today is that this is a silicon-based material, not silicon oxide, and it has some very interesting features that derive from the fact that it still is a semiconductor. Um, one uh, probably key and very important aspect of the porous silicon system is these very uh, easily tunable pore size, and, and by that I mean easily tunable in a size range that we uh, care about for things like large proteins. It's, it's difficult to take, say, for instance, sol gel materials and make 50 nanometer pores that uh, will readily accommodate antibodies or larger oligos. Um, it's a photoactive material. As I mentioned, it's a semiconductor. You can make quantum dots out of it. Typically, you can, you can tune the emission band for the quantum dots over the entire visible range and into the near infrared. 
Uh, it's a photoconductive material. It also is very effective at doing fo two-photon excitation. And people have used two-photon excitation to just get emission out of the material and also have been able to generate singlet oxygen from that nanostructure um, and uh, other reactive oxygen species. Uh, it's got a very uh, long excited state lifetime. That's going to be a key aspect of my talk today. Uh, and then uh, this non -tox low toxicity for this degradation pathway is another keystone that I'm going to talk on. And then finally, the ability to, to take these large, fairly open uh, structures, uh, place lots of targeting groups on them, and then target them effectively to tissues. And that's what I'll end with. So this is a quick uh, uh, slide summary of how we make uh, silicon-based uh, nanoparticles. Uh, the movie showing here is the electrochemical etching process. We drill out this porous nanostructure. All those bubbles that you see there are hydrogen. We take the porous layer and remove it. That's being rinsed off there. Uh, and that in the pad there is a, a film of porous silicon. It's being sonicated there to be made into micro or nanoparticles. And ultimately then those particles that we generate, uh, you can see here in this film, uh, are uh, you know, anywhere in the size range we, we, we pick. But they have this porous nanostructure still embedded in them. And uh, so uh, what can you do with these? Uh, this is maybe a little bit better picture of them. Uh, you'll notice that in this, uh, I, I don't have time to go into the details, but to make these uh, nanoparticles, uh, the method that we use allows us to actually uh, clip them off layer by layer uh, to make, uh, this is now a typically, like this particle here is about a, I don't know, around 200, 300 uh, nanometers uh, across here. Uh, you can see that if you look sort of plan view or top down, you can see these poor channels in some of these structures like there and there and that one. Uh, but they're, uh, they're, they're flattened on, on two edges. They're kind of ta uh, tablets. And so this sample here, for example, shows you the two flat faces of that porous structure. You can see that in a, in a number of these uh, particles in this, in this field. And uh, what does that give you? That actually is a, more of a tabular or a... a a, a flat structure, but also it's very anisotropic in how it dissolves uh, and um, also in how it releases drugs then. And so I'm just going to give a quick uh, view through um, the, this concept of uh, releasing drugs in a little bit more uh, uniform and um, uh, steady fashion. Uh, and so the concept basically comes from this type of calculation, very simple calculation. Just say I'm going to take a sphere of some material and let it dissolve, or I'm going to take a tablet, a slab and let it dissolve. And those red dots in those uh, two uh, pictures are the drug that's in the material, uh, the payload you're trying to release. Uh, and the, uh, notionally, they're the same volumes, uh, uh, same mass of material. Uh, but of course, spheres, any structure dissolves from the outside in. And a sphere, uh, the, the uh, surface to volume ratio changes the most rapidly. Uh, and so in the end, what that gives you then is that the, the rate of dissolution falls off very quickly uh, for, for an individual sphere as it gets smaller. And the blue trace just shows notionally what would happen if this sphere were dissolving out and releasing an embedded drug as it dissolved away. Uh, this is the typical uh, kind of volcano curve you'd see with a very long uh, tail that just trails off over, again, this calculation was done for notional two-month uh, drug delivery type of uh, application. Uh, on the other hand, if you take a slab and you dissolve it, it doesn't dissolve as, as uh, uh, the, the area changes less rapidly with volume. Uh, and so you get the, the red trace here. And more importantly, the green trace shows if you have an anisotropic dissolution. So the slab is getting thinner 10 times faster than the edges uh, move in. Uh, then you can actually get a very good uh, profile. And what I mean by good is that your, your concentration of drug uh, for some period of time is quite stable and flat, and that's what that's supposed to indicate. And then at, at the end of that, when the slab has gotten almost perfectly atomically thin, eventually it dissolves away completely, and you get a very rapid drop-off. And so that's the, the theory anyway. Um, here's some data uh, demonstrating that for a, a particle. And these are now micron-sized particles uh, loaded with donorubicin. The donorubicin was loaded into this structure by covalent attachment. And, and what you see here on the left are two charts, uh, uh, dissolution of free drug. Uh, so this is an experiment where we had a chamber, one, one uh, compartment pharmacokinetic model. We're flushing it out and monitoring the drug released. And so the light blue dots are just the free drug injected directly into the chamber, and that just shows how fast the chamber uh, washes out in this particular experiment. 
Uh, and under the same conditions, if you take the, that drug and load it into one of these structures, then the drug is released on a much more slowly and, uh, and also very linearly. And that's the, kind of the surprising thing is how linear that actually is. And what that uh, translates to then in terms of the, the therapeutic window is the concentration of drug is maintained at a very flat uh, concentration profile over that same 30-day period that we were running that experiment. So that's what you get with an anisotropic and a tabular type of a structure. Now I want to talk about the photochemical properties of the material. And I want to start this story with uh, quantum dots. Um, these are uh, cadmium selenide-based quantum dots. I think this image is everywhere, <laughs> almost everywhere. Uh, and it's hanging up in the National Academy of Sciences. This is a, an image from Munji Buendi's group at MIT taken by Felice Frankel, a scientific photographer. Uh, just showing uh, the different uh, CAD selenide based quantum dots. Uh, these are different size uh, nanoparticles. Uh, the small ones emit blue and the large ones emit red, a classic characteristic of, of quantum confinement. Um, and what I want to talk about are uh, silicon based quantum dots, and what you're looking at here are uh, particles in a vial, uh, and these are some of the nanoparticles under black light. Uh, showing the luminescent property of the silicon. And uh, just like in the, the, the CAD selenide-based quantum dots, these silicon-based dots uh, are emitting due to quantum confinement. Um, there's a lot of surface chemistry involved, too, and a lot of uh, surface states that are involved in that energy, that emission process. But the bottom line is the main uh, phenomenon that you see coming that gives you the origin of that orange color that you're seeing in that image is this quantum confinement but unlike a quantum dot where the nanoparticle is a little ball, um, these structures are, are open sponges. And so the quantum confined domains in one of these nanoparticles are really just the little branches or the twigs on the trees of the uh, silicon forest making up that nanoparticle. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the degradation of this material. Uh, and, and why we were motivated to look at silicon as opposed to CAD selenide. It's been known now for some time that the, the quantum dots derived from 2,6 uh, materials can be toxic. Uh, they can be hepatotoxic. They generate uh, cell death. Um, if you put a zinc sulfide coating, that will attenuate the toxicity, but it does not eliminate it. And I've just lit, put up some leading references, uh, a couple from Warren Chan's group and um, Sangeet Dabatia, one of my collaborators, uh, at MIT, a um, number of other groups that have looked at uh, Vicki Colvin have looked at these, uh, these issues. And so that's been the concern, is that these materials would not find their way into clinic because of their toxicity, um, and, uh, and particularly if they don't get cleared. Uh, and so for the silicon system, you're a little bit more better off in that the uh, degradation products, which are really just defined by these two equations, are, are quite uh, uh, non-toxic. Um, silicon, when it's uh, in its nanostructured form, will oxidize fairly readily in water or in, 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 in uh, media uh, to make silicon oxide. The silicon oxide then dissolves to make silicic acid. And um, orthosilicate or silicic acid is present in, your, in our plasma at about a concentration of 5 ppm. So, uh, you know, all of our vegetables have a lot of silica in them, uh, second most abundant element in the Earth's crust. So you end up, your body knows how to handle it. You end up digesting a lot of it, and, uh, and your body can get rid of it. And so that's, that's really the contrast to the, this, uh, the um, uh, uh, cadmium and other uh, uh, heavy metal-based systems. So the, uh, the characteristics, I just want to use this slide to summarize some of the characteristics of these materials, uh, typically 150 nanometers in size. Um, a fairly broad photoluminescence spectrum typically peaks in the near-infrared the excitation profile is uh, in the UV or the blue. Although, as I mentioned, you can do two-photon excitation to excite these materials. Um, they're photostable, so they don't degrade uh, too uh, dramatically over time when they're being excited. Uh, and this chart here just shows a comparison of the porous silicon nanoparticles, which is that red trace, to uh, the three uh, common organic dyes used in bioimaging. It just shows how rapidly these organic dyes will photobleach over a 10-minute period under some notional UV excitation, um, whereas the, these silicon materials, just like the, the CAD selenide quantum dots, are quite photostable. However, unlike um, 
the quantum dots, the silicon does dissolve, and so at a longer time scale, and what's shown in this last chart is this longer time scale, the silicon will dissolve. And that's very dependent on the surface chemistry and the nanostructure and the material. So uh, a few years back, we, we capitalized on this feature and, and used those materials to image uh, tumors in animals. This was the first time a silicon-based quantum dot had been used to image a tumor. Uh, this is a tumor in the back hind quarter of a mouse. We injected these nanoparticles in the tail vein and they circulated through the bloodstream um, and then eventually accumulated via the EPR effect uh, in the tumor. And uh, probably more importantly is not that they accumulated and we were able to image them, but that they then degraded over the space of a few days uh, and dissolved away. And we see the silicon showing up in the feces and the, the urine of the animal is mostly silicic acid. Uh, I'll skip over this. So, and we looked at the biodistribution of the materials and the, and the gross toxicity of the materials and saw no, uh, no uh, evidence of, of any kind of toxicity. We did, however, notice that these particles will accumulate and be cleared by the body's organs that do that kind of thing, the liver, the spleen, and the kidneys. You can see them showing up there, but after uh, four weeks, they've cleared away. So I want to spend uh, last few minutes of my time talking about this uh, new aspect of of, the, of, uh, of these materials that I've been pretty excited about last uh, uh, year or so, and that is that these materials have this very long-lived excited state, and um, it comes from the fact that silicon is an indirect gap material, and uh, as an indirect gap material, uh, it needs a phonon to assist its de-excitation pathway. It takes a while for that to happen, and so the lifetime of these materials tend to be out in the microsecond range rather than uh, nanoseconds, where most organic and quantum dot systems emit. So what you're looking at here is an image uh, under just steady-state illumination of uh, the silicon dots and the cad selenide dots. This is with a a, uh, this is actually a colorized image. We tried to match the color of what they looked like, but this is a black and white high-speed camera uh, taking this image. Um, and then uh, we pulsed uh, the, the, the sample and waited for uh, you know, about uh, two microseconds. And uh, you'll see in this image that, of course, the cad selenide-based dots or any organic dye that has a you know, 10 nanosecond or shorter lifetime will decay away very completely in that period of time, but these silicon dots are still emitting. And so in, by time gating the experiment, you can actually cut out a lot of the uh, background fluorescence that you might see in an in, in vivo imaging experiment. So for example, Psi 3.5, one nanosecond lifetime, this is a decay curve in nanoseconds um, for, uh, for that. This goes out to eight nanoseconds. Uh, similar decay curve that you'd see for porous silicon nanoparticles um, now, um, I've done this on the same length of this axis to try to make these look the same, but in fact, if you look at the x-axis, that's a factor of uh, 10,000 longer in time. And so, the real key aspect of this that you can trigger on then is if you just gate out here at, at 20 nanoseconds, which I'm going to show data for, uh, you still have a lot of intensity from the porous silicon. Um, up 20 nanoseconds is like right there, up there somewhere. Um, but um, by most of the organic dyes have, have all gone away. Uh, why is that? Um, as, I, as I alluded to, the um, silicon has a number of different emission and de-excitation pathways. Uh, quantum confinement is one I've been focusing on today, but there are a lot of other bands associated with silicon, um, and many of them have fairly long-lived excited states. Uh, the uh, typical oxide-based defects, just like a lot of organic dyes, are fairly fast. In the porous silicon community, we refer to this as the F-band or the fast band, typically around two nanoseconds. But the S-band, or so-called slow band, is the one we are triggering on here. That's what's generally in our field we refer to as the quantum confined band. Um, and that, again, is in the few microseconds. So uh, this is uh, uh, an ex experiment. Now I'm just going to show a few images of a mouse uh, with two tumors, contralateral tumors. Um, and this is an image of the, the tumors uh, in, under continuous wave, and um, this is a time-gated image. Okay, so we're doing this experiment. If you look up here at the top, um, our time gate's out here at about 20 nanoseconds, um, and that's really limited by the imaging system we had. Uh, the imaging systems typically in our, our cancer clinic 
uh, are, are, are focused on molecules that have very short lifetimes, so they just don't have these long lifetime systems out there that people are looking at. So the, the, the rep rate of the laser limited us to 20 nanoseconds. Uh, so this red trace is a porous silicon photoluminescence intensity, and you can see it looks really essentially flat at this time scale, whereas the tissue autofluorescence that we're measuring here in a separate experiment is decaying the way you'd expect it. Uh, and so this experiment is without um, anything in there, and you can see in a continuous wave you see the standard tissue autofluorescence. There's some ghost images there just having to do with the autofluorescence and endogenous uh, molecules in the, in the animal. Uh, then um, we injected um, these animals with uh, the nanoparticles, and here you see um, them showing up in continuous wave, but you'll notice that you can still see background, of course, in the continuous wave image, so we're not, you know, we're not suppressing that because it's still there. There's no, no reason it shouldn't be there. It's in, there in the original image. But if we time gate now, where normally time gating would blank everything, all the native luminescence out, you can still see these uh, nanoparticles quite brightly in the image. And so really this um, long excited state gives you about 100 times uh, contrast relative to the tissue autofluorescence at, at a 20 nanosecond gate. And then what we, uh, we did was to look then at, uh, um, uh, in I, the, those last images I showed were actually direct tumor injections, so it's kind of cheating. Um, here we're um, doing a, a, a tail vein injection and monitoring the appearance of the nanoparticles again in the tumor, but now using this time gated um, mode. And what you'll see is that if you go over uh, a long enough time, right after injection, uh, you don't really see much. Um, even in the time gated image, we've had to push the contrast up to, to look for it, and there's nothing there. Four hours after the injection, the particles have had time to accumulate in the tumor, and you start seeing a pretty strong uh, signal due to that in that time gated image. Uh, again, remember this is a 20 na nanosecond gate, so you do still see some background associated with that. Um, some residual fluorescence that hasn't died off and scattering events. Uh, and then um, at 24 hours post-injection, you can see the particles have cleared. And so I think probably the most important aspect of these images, we did not do any cutoffs. This is, there's no thresholding used in these images. So most people don't show these images. Most people will put in a threshold to, to just enhance the contrast of their, of their dye. You don't have to do that with this, these images because this time gating uh, gives you such a long uh, and, and persistent emission from your, your, your trigger or from your, um, your nanoparticle. Um, so I'll just spend a few minutes. How much time do I have? I didn't see what my... What? What? 920? Oh, good. Okay, I'm good. All right, I'm not going to slow. I'm not going to slow. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, thank you. I'm not going to slow down, though. Um, okay, so I just want to finish off with a, a couple of uh, a little discussion on targeting. Um, and uh, we started doing this work with Erky Roslati many years ago. Erky's uh, the guy who invented RGD and uh, the RGD peptide, uh, which is a uh, now it's uh, in clinical trials as a targeted uh, therapy for tumors. Um, and uh, Erky's been making these peptides for quite some time. And uh, he, uh, the latest one, which he published uh, about you know three years ago in Science, is this IRGD. He calls it uh, the I stands for internalizing because this particular sequence that has an RGD motif in it, but it's a sequence that actually will internalize into tissues uh, and go across the cell membrane and go into cells. And what you're looking at here are some porous silicon nanoparticles with that targeting peptide attached to them. And um, the, the green, in this case, actually, is the, uh, is the porous silicon nanoparticles. And what you're looking at here is, uh, um, uh, the, turns out, the IRGD triggers on neuropillin. And so if you have a neuropillin-positive uh, cell line, then those particles will attach and, and internalize. And that's what you're seeing here. So the neuro, this is sort of the control experiment. Neuropillin-negative cells do not show any targeting. Um, and the... Uh, porous silicon, targeted porous silicon on these uh, HEY cells, which are neuropillin positive, um, show that targeting. And so um, that's uh, one example of uh, targeting uh, tumor cells. I want to spend 
uh, uh, most of my few minutes remaining talking about this experiment, which is targeting dendritic cells. Uh, and so what you're looking at here is a confocal image stack um, scanning through a, a, a set of uh, dendritic cells. The, the green color now is the, uh, the membrane stain that we're using, and the red is the porous silicon nanoparticles. And you can see they've also internalized into the cells. Um, the targeting group we're using in this case is not Erkes peptide, but it's a, an antibody, very simple um, antibody um, for a, a receptor on the dendritic cell surface known as CD40, and the antibody we're using is FGK45. This is commercially available, and we could just attach it using um, David Walt's biotin strept avidin, avidin chemistry. Um, and so we take porous silicon, we load avidin on the surface, and then we take a biotinylated antibody and put it on the particle. And really, the, uh, the, the concept here is that you have, just to talk a little bit about biology first, the, um, the uh, CD40, which is a cellular receptor, um, will, is involved in this cascade that turns on uh, the immune response via this uh, interaction of the dendritic cells with T cells. Um, and that's the typical interaction. And you can kind of fake that thing, the system out, by adding this antibody uh, to the CD40 receptor, and you'll also turn on the immune response, or you turn on some downstream uh, 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 cellular um, markers that you can then pick up in, a, in, a, um, in an assay. And so the, the concept in the experiment was to take the porous silicon particles, and instead of using just a single antibody to turn this on, we're going to see if we can get a multivalent effect by um, attaching many of these antibodies to the particle hopefully then engaging in, in multiple interactions with those uh, receptors and to improve the response. Uh, and in fact, that's what we saw. And so uh, what you're looking at here are uh, basically the control experiment. Again, the green is just the membrane stain. Um, and the, uh, this LPSINP, that's a um, uh, luminescent porous silicon nanoparticles. Uh, and so with nothing on them uh, put into this solution, you don't see them show up. Again, the red is the porous silicon nanoparticles. Um, then, of course, if we have the FGK antibody attached to them, um, then we see a response. And that was the image I showed at the beginning of my uh, this little um, uh, description here. Uh, and then um, this is an experiment where we uh, pre-saturated the, the surface with uh, FGK free antibody, just showing that it was actually that pathway that brought those particles in. If we saturate those receptors with the free antibody, then our antibody loaded particles do not um, target the cells and they don't go in. And so the, the concept here is that, okay, now if, if you're looking at uh, this next set of uh, charts that I'm showing here, are uh, really comparing the particles to the free antibody um, on a molecule by molecule basis. So we're doing it, if you look at the x axis here, uh, on these two charts, we're looking at the upregulation of these markers, either CD86 or MHC2, the major histocompatibility complex class 2. Um, and uh, we're looking at them uh, as a function of concentration of antibody, you know, given to the, uh, the, in, in, the in the Petri dish. And um, we're doing it based on total concentration of antibody, not particle. So this is comparing apples to apples, the same number of antibodies. And what you'll see here, for example, for an amount of, uh, of regulation, a twofold improvement over control, um, the, uh, the nanoparticles, which are all the colored dots here, uh, will uh, give us a response at about 10 nanograms per mil of FGK45, whereas we have to, it's at least a factor of 100 uh, more uh, in concentration that you need if you don't have an antiparticle there, if you just give it the free antibody. So the open traces here, the free antibody and these solids, circles, and, and objects are antibody attached to the nanoparticle. You see the same thing for MHC2. So uh, what we conclude from this is that the um, antibodies attached to the nanoparticles are giving us a multivalent effect and that we're improving the response uh, by a factor of about 20 to 40 of the immune response um, if we can attach the targeting group to a nanoparticle as opposed to just using the targeting group on its own. So that's the end of my story. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I think the things that we've learned out of this, uh, probably the, uh, the, the one that I want to impress on you the most maybe is capitalizing on the ability of silicon to be used as a biomaterial and to use the electrochemistry of silicon 
to provide us with uh, uh, nanostructures that we can uh, that allow us to do that. Um, the luminescent materials um, enabled us to do uh, a number of interesting in vivo types of imaging uh, applications. Uh, drug delivery does not really require the luminescence, but I mentioned briefly that, that at the beginning of my talk, just to, the, another feature of these materials is they have this porous nanostructure that you can load a, a drug payload in. Uh, and then finally, we talked about um, in vivo applications and uh, uh, targeting via sort of passive routes and, and active routes and uh, capitalizing on the luminescence properties of the material to be able to trace them. So with that, I'll thank my coworkers and uh, my collaborators. Uh, a lot of this work, as I mentioned, Erki Roslati uh, has been a key player in that. Sangeeta Bhatia also has been a key uh, collaborator uh, in this work. The uh, lifetime imaging work was all done by Luo Gu, who had this idea uh, a few years ago uh, and uh, really took it all to completion. And it's, it's really a, a credit to him. He's, uh, he's a fabulous uh, graduate student and really uh, he and Joe Park who both kind of worked on this uh, in vivo applications of the silicon nanoparticles when they were both graduate students in my group are the ones that really put this story together. And, and finally, thanks and congratulations to you, David, and thank you. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Um, but I'll just repeat that. So David's asking if the lifetime of the porous silicon degrades as the material degrades. Um, and in fact, it does. And, and, and that's one of the key things that, that I didn't have time to talk about, but Luo was focusing on um, in his thesis was that um, you can actually basically use that porous silicon nanoparticle as a timer to tell you how, how long it has to go to dissolve. You can also use it as a timer to tell you how long it's been circulating because the lifetime does change. In fact, it gets shorter. Uh, typically, they start out at uh, something like 20 microseconds and they'll go down, they'll eventually go down to a few nanoseconds and then they kind of peter out and at that point you don't see anything. Uh, so that you have this ability that's time-gating, a very important aspect of it is people talk about doing multiplexing with different colors um, you know, you can multiplex with red, green, and blue and do three different experiments at once in your Petri dish and you image in three color channels. You can also image in three different time channels, and that's what this really enables because you have an ability to tune that lifetime. That's a good point. Right. So the question is, have we looked at uh, in vivo, uh, you know, taking this further and going in vivo with these things and looking at how they affect the, uh, the immune response in, in an organism, I guess, mainly? So the answer is no. Um, we've done a few experiments where we've done uh, injections and seen these go into the lymphatics, but we didn't get them very, they didn't go very far, and we were not able to get any kind of upregulation in vivo. Uh, and so right now, this in vitro data stands, I believe it's, it's correct, but we're not able to duplicate that in vivo, mainly because the particles just didn't, the ones that had that antibody attached to the service didn't circulate and didn't give us the effect that we wanted to. So it's been a failure at this point. It's, we still are interested in pursuing that, but we can, I can't say anything more on that now. I just don't have anything else on it. Yeah, it was sub-Q, uh, yeah, a foot pad, foot pad injection and... They didn't get up into the leg. <laughs> they went a little bit into the leg. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you.